Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Today we pick up chapter 8. I'll just do the first three verses for you today. My chest is tightening, and I want to get done before I start coughing spastically on <clears throat> on YouTube for the audience to watch. But um, the radio guys will hate this because they have to edit out all those little things. I'll sound great on the radio. Don't worry. They won't even know I have a cold. But um, thanks to RT. He'll fix it up. And Steve. But <clears throat> chapter 8, it starts off, it says, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols. But well, we know... We know that, all, that we all have knowledge about idols. Now, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. In Corinth, did they have idol, idolatry in, in their culture in Corinth? What was their culture influenced by in Corinth? Anyone know their, the Corinthian culture? What, what kind of background? What nationality of folks lived around Corinth area? You got some Italians, some Greeks, right? You got Greek culture. The Greeks were polytheistic, by the way. They were, had many gods, Zeus, Hermes, Paphrodites. They had all these different gods and goddesses, and they would have statues all over the place. Did Paul have to deal with people that came up, growing up with statues in their house of different gods and goddesses, and then came to his church, and he says, let me declare to you the one true God, God Almighty. And they're like, which one is he? Zeus or Hermes? No, no, no. Above all those guys. Those guys, those are actually with little g, false gods. I'm going to tell you about the true God. And this was, this was really eye-opening for them. But Paul had already, he, he had already preached that message, I know. And he, he, here he's just saying, we already have knowledge about this. But he'll tell some more because obviously they had some more questions about idols that he's going to have to go into at the, in, in, further on into this chapter. But before he gets there, he makes a statement that I can't pass over. One that every Christian should probably highlight right on their mirror, put on the, you know, refrigerator. The end of chapter, uh, of verse 1 says, knowledge, he says, we all have knowledge, right? But knowledge makes what? Arrogant. Or puffs up, the King James says. Knowledge, knowledge puffeth up. Puffeth up. Like a, like a pastry. Puffeth up. You ever seen someone with a big head? Puffed up head? They're, they're, they're so smart. They know so much. They can't get through the doorway their head's so big. That's what knowledge does. Knowledge puffs up. But Paul says, but love, love builds up or edifies. Love looks out for the other person. It builds them up. Now, Paul says something that I'm sure everyone that's, well, I'm just going to pick an age. Everyone over about somewhere around 40-ish and up knows verse 2 without even having read it. Because it says, If any man supposes that he knows anything, he knows not yet as he ought to know. Can anyone over 40 give an amen? Have you ever noticed, like, when you really start to learn something, and you really get into it, and you're learning, and you're learning. And the more you learn, the more you realize how much you have still yet to learn. I mean, you thought when you knew little, you had it down, man. I know it all. You, like, learned one verse of the Bible. I can tell you the Bible. I read one verse. <laughs> I have taught every verse, chapter, every chapter, every verse. I've looked up most of it in other languages, in its, in its original language. And all I can tell you is... Oh my, there is so much more to learn. I mean, you just, it, it's a weird thing. If you suppose you know anything, Paul says you don't know yet as you ought to know. You're just scratching the surface. You're just beginning. He says, but listen to this. And, and by the way, you might want to put this verse too on your, on your fridge too. Because if you suppose you know anything, you know not yet as you ought to know. But, verse 3, he says, but. But what? This is a but that he's going to say in verse 3 is probably the most important verse, I think, in the whole Bible. 
I'm not going to tell you what it says yet, though. I'm going to tell you why I think it's the most important verse. Because I, you know, when I was a new Christian, I was like, well, where do you start reading the book? And what's the first book of the Bible? Genesis. What's the first? That's the Old Testament. What's the first book of the New Testament? Matthew. So I go like this. I start reading Genesis in the Old Testament. And then I, I'm told, well, there's a New Testament, so I've got to read. I'll just start at the beginning, go to Matthew. So I start reading Matthew. <coughs> and have you ever noticed when you read the Bible how sometimes you're reading along and you find yourself getting more questions about your faith than you're getting answers? You, you, like, you read it, you go, what? I don't get that. What about this? And pretty soon you're like, I better go to church. I've got to find out what all this stuff means. Because, like, I literally was reading myself into a bunch of questions. And I'm reading along, and I get to chapter 6, and it's that chapter that Jesus, it was one of the few verses, because I, I was raised R Italian Roman Catholic, it was one of my favorite ones. I came, I found a verse that I actually knew. It was when I got to verse 9 of chapter 6, it said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be a, I knew this prayer, man, because I had to do penance, like, a lot. <coughs> I could do, the, I could speed pray this one, you know. I was like, all oh, right, I found something in the Bible. I know this prayer already. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. This is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You guys know the rest, right? And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Least not into temptation, deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory. Amen. And then I read on, if you forgive others their transgressions, verse 14 of Matthew 6, then your Father will also forgive you. But, oh no, another but. But if you do not forgive, I, I, maybe you wouldn't want to hear this part at church today. Verse 15, Matthew 6. If you do not forgive others, then your heavenly Father will not, what? Forgive you. The only part of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus revisits is the forgiveness line. He doesn't talk about more about the daily bread. We all get that. Give us this day our daily. He doesn't talk more about forgive. Uh, I mean, about uh, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it. No, he only talks about the forgiveness thing. And and that part they didn't teach us that part. I knew the prayer. I just didn't know the zinger that came at the end. Because this, by the way, it was in words in red in my Bible are the words of Jesus, and it was Jesus still talking. I'm like, how come they didn't teach us this part? Because it seems kind of important. If you forgive, you get forgiven. If you don't forgive, guess what? I mean, I never even thought of it until then. I was like, this is loaded. It's a loaded prayer. Forgive me my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. What if I don't forgive those who sin against me? What did I just pray? Don't forgive me. Have you ever thought that one through? I mean, that's kind of loaded, isn't it? That's a loaded prayer. You're going, God, forgive me as I forgive those that sin against me. Only I don't forgive them. That person really made me mad. They cut me off in traffic. I want to drive over the top of them. The Lord goes, I ain't forgiven you. That's what you literally just prayed. Well, then I kept reading. And it, it, it says, store up your treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy or thieves can't break in and steal for where your treasure is that's where your heart will be oh well, that's pretty good i like that and then it said in verse 25 of matthew 6 don't don't be worried about your life what you're going to eat what you're going to drink don't be worried about your body what you're going to put on for life is more than food and the body is more than clothing look at the birds of the air how many of you know this verse from matthew Look at the birds of the air, they don't sow, nor do they reap, nor do they gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And how much more are you worth than them? Are you not worth more? This is the words of Jesus. Are we worth more to God than a bird? Yes. We are created in his image, and Jesus says, just look at the birds. You can hear him. I can hear him cheeping right up. One just flew into that tree right there. Did that bird do any planting or sowing or working to get fed today? No, but God makes sure it gets fed. 
And you're, this is good words. I mean, I was reading this. I'm a new Christian. I'm like, this is great. And then I get to verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. I'm like, this book is awesome. Until I get to chapter 7. And the verse verse says, do not judge. <laughs> Lest ye be what? Oh, no. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by the standard of measure you make, it will be measured to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that is in the beam that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold the log... I mean, can you imagine some guy walking at you with a log sticking out of his eye going, come here, let me help you get that speck out. You're like, get away, man. You got a log. You know, smack me in the face with your own log. <laughs> Jesus said, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly enough to take out the speck of your brother's eye. And I went, oh, that's good. And I got to verse 7. Matt, Matthew 7, 7. This is an easy one to remember. Ask, and it shall be what? Given to you. Seek, and you shall what? Find. Knock, and the door will be open. Anyone heard that verse before? The, the seek, ask, knock. Is that a good verse? I was like, I am on a spiritual high. This book is good. You just ask. And it says, verse 8, For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And he who knocks, it shall be open. It doesn't say it might be open. If you ask God, you seek him, you knock, he'll open the door for you. Does it say m maybe? And by the way, just for a hint, what color print is my Bible? Can you see from far back there? Red. It's in red. Who said it? Jesus. Jesus said that. That means I can count on it. I can count on it. If he says, then okay, I'll ask. Now, in everything, verse 12, he said, in everything, therefore, Treat people the same way that you want them to treat you. For this, this is the whole fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And we call it the golden rule. I, I actually read this and went, wait a minute. Treat others as you want them to treat, be treated? Wait a minute. The nuns used to tell us this all the time. I didn't actually know the golden rule was a verse. In the very first book of the New Testament. Did you guys? You might already know this. But when I was a new Christian, I was like, Wow! I found the Lord's Prayer, and I found the Golden Rule, all in like the same day reading. This is a great day. Oh, I like only read two chapters of the Bible, but I'm doing pretty good. I'm like, now I know everything. <laughs> See, it happens when you're young, okay? You think you know it all. I knew two places in the Bible where I knew a verse that I already knew the verse, but I knew where it was now. I know it all. Until I read a little further... And, the, and it's in the middle of this chapter I came to one of the biggest questions I, what, what I consider the question of all, all, everyone who ever walks the earth will eventually come up with this question. I found out this is the, Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus said then, enter through the narrow gate, verse 13. The gate is wide that leads, and it's broad, he says, that leads to destruction. And there are many who are there upon it. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And few find it. This got me thinking. I want to make sure I find the right, the, you know, the right gate. I want to go through. The, and he said, beware of false prophets who, who come to you as sheep in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're wolves. They just got sheep's clothing on the outside. By the way, if you ever want to figure out what if someone's a sheep or a wolf in sheep's clothing, how do you tell? They look the same on the outside. What they eat. Correct. The wolves eat sheep. Sheep eat grass. Just a hint. If they're around eating sheep, you know they are not true sheep. Now Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from, from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? And every good tree bears good fruit, but bad trees bear bad fruit. And a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's all it's good for. It's just firewood. And so then you will know them by their fruits. Now, 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he will enter it. Now, when I read that, I was like, oh, here's the key. The one who does the will of the Father gets to go to heaven. The one that doesn't do it, he's not getting in. And then I read a little further. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, did we not cast out demons? And in your name, did we not perform miracles? And then I will declare to them. How many of you read verse 23 of Matthew 7? Then I will declare to them. This was like, ah! Depart from me, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. He quotes Psalm 6, verse 8. Jesus does. Do you know God's got the right to say, get out? I didn't know you. Now, as soon as I read this, this was my question. First, well, first of all, it was, I never want to hear those words come from Jesus' lips to me. I don't know about you, but as soon as I read that, I was like, look, of all the things I want to hear Jesus say to me when we, when we cross over, I want to make sure it's, well done, good and faithful servant. Come into my rest, not depart from me, I never knew you. So as soon as I read this verse, I was like, okay, it's still in red. Jesus said this. Do you think he'll actually say this to some people? Depart. But these are people who did miracles and cast out demons and, and, did, and they prophesied. I mean, they're pretty spiritual stuff. I mean, they're not like they didn't do nothing. But they, prophesied money for it. they could have done it for money. They could have done it for all sorts of reasons, right? For show. But Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. And I thought, okay, wait a minute. This is, what, this is where the question popped up in my brain. I went, how do I make sure? It's not whether I know him. Because see, I'm reading all the book thinking, I got to know him to get in. I got to learn the secrets. Where's the verses? Where's the stuff that makes sure that I get into heaven? And the further I read, the more I realize, it's not really based on whether I know the verses or I know him. What it's based on is what? If he knows me. I mean, I got to make sure he knows me so I can get in. And so my whole focus on the Bible shifted. I'm like, where is the verse? Now I need to find another one. But I need to know where is the verse that makes sure that he knows me. Not that, you know, you can say you know him. That doesn't matter. We're talking about the, the king of all kings, the, 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 the one that's in charge of the whole universe. I mean, I understand authority growing up in a military family. You can't just walk onto a military base and say, as a civilian, well, let me in. <laughs> There's these guys at this gate. They say, no, you don't have authority to be here. And you can't, as a civilian, you can't walk up to the White House and go, let me in. I want to see, you know, talk to the president. I'm a citizen. Does that get you through the front door, by the way? Sorry, doesn't work. Now, when, when Obama was president, I, I was teaching this very same, I was teaching it from Matthew's side, and we were going to turn back to 1 Corinthians 8 in just a minute to get the answer. But I was saying, J you, okay, so he was in Hawaii before he went, you know, over there. And what if you were, you were, you grew up with him, you went to school. Can you go up to the White House and go, well, we went to school together, let me in. Does that, do they say, oh, well, okay, special exception. You went to school with the president. You can go on in. No. But what if at the time President Obama walked by the door and he looked out and saw you and went, oh, we went to school together. Hey, guys, let him in. Could you go in then? If the guy in authority says, you can come in, guess what? You get to go in. But if the guy in authority says, I don't know him, Guess what the Secret Service guys will do with that guy? He's going to leave the lawn. I mean, they're going to escort him, I mean, away, right? He doesn't get in. It's the guy in authority has to make, do you understand this relationship? He has to be the one who knows you for you to get in. And it's the same with God in his kingdom. 
you got to make sure that the big man knows who you. As soon as I read this and it said, Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. I was like, where is the verse? Is there, is there a verse that says how we can make sure he knows me? Who cares about all the other verses? I mean, seriously, I, I, I'm not saying like, who cares? Like, they don't mean anything. But I mean, like, in the big picture, is this an important one? So I started hunting. I started devouring, scouring the Bible. Where is the verse? Where is the And, you know, I went Matthew, page by page, verse by verse. Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Still haven't found the verse. Where is the verse that says, he knows me? And I get all the way to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the passage we're studying today. And if you look with me now, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, <coughs> knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes he knows anything, he knows not yet as he ought to know, but, you better highlight verse 3, but, if anyone loves God, he is what? Known by him. I found it. I found the verse right here. This is probably the most important verse in the whole Bible. If you love God, by the way, remember when the, that, that attorney went to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says to him, well, how's it read to you? He's like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as your what? Yourself. She said, good job. Go and do it. You'll live. <laughs> and who's my neighbor? That's when he told, we just went over this Friday night at Family Night about the Good Samaritan. When Jesus answered the, the question to that, who is my neighbor? But here, the biggest, grandest question is, is the greatest command of all Scripture is to love the Lord. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your being. Love God. Is that an important one to point out to people in our culture? When they go to church and they hear all these wonderful messages about, you know, you just have to have a good self-image and you just have to have Think positive, and you need to, you know. And I'm like, that's all grand and everything, except you're missing out on one important thing. It, even if you teach them how to do miracles and prophesy and do all these wonderful things, and they do great works of charity, and they help the poor, and Paul's going to go on and tell us in Corinthians here, in this just coming up in this chapter, if you do all these things and you don't have love, it's nothing. It's not knowledge is king. It's love is king. And love for God is king above all things. And if I don't teach you it right, I mean, I, I might as well tell you, the most important thing you can take away from this today is just make sure that you love God. You're the only one that can tell if you love God in your heart. But if you do, guess what I get to tell you? God knows you. And when you go walking by those pearly gates and you're wondering, can I get in? And Kate's going, I love God. He's going to look out and go, I know her. Let her in. And the angel is going to go, you're in. I don't know about you, but I wanted to make sure he knows me. I don't want him saying, oh, I didn't know you. So what's the, what's the condition? What do I have to do to make sure he knows me? Love him. Is it a choice of my will? Yes. It's not a hard choice, by the way, because once you find out how much God loves you, you're like, this ain't hard. I mean, really, the Bible says we actually know how to love because he first loved us. It's not like the other way around. He doesn't say, you love me, and then I'll show you some love. No, he's like, I'll show you what love is. And we just respond to that. We, we're, we're wired where we respond so well. When we're really truly loved, unconditionally loved. How many of you guys know God's love is unconditional? He doesn't go, well, I love you, but, you know, you dress a little funny. Or I love you, but, you know, you need to change the way you part your hair. Or I don't have a part, but okay, you know. 
Does the Lord have any conditions on his love? None. Because I love you, period. Now, I love you so much, I mean, I, you know, you're in a kind of a bad state there. And it's amazing how many people meet the Lord in a really down place in life. They're in the, the valley of despair. And God goes, I love you. And he meets the person right there. But, you know, he loves you so much, he doesn't say, well, I love you, but you'll have to get yourself out of that. No, he says, I love you so much, I'm going to help you. I, my love is unconditional. I love you, period. But I love you too much to leave you in that state. Come on, let me help you out. That, that kind of love is the love that we respond to. We go, oh, thank you for the love that you love us with. But if you don't want to say, I love you to the Lord, then you're going to have a big problem someday when we stand before him. Because you're going to go, bye-bye. Depart. I don't, I don't know you. You know, you ever wonder why a lot of praise songs have lyrics about, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Right? We, we're singing that we love the Lord. Is that allowed? By the way, I think it's highly recommended. But this is really something we should get used to saying. That I love you, God. Because it's the greatest command. But some of you are like, it's a private thing. I don't really talk about it. I love my wife. I don't know how to tell you this, but I don't mind talking about it. And that's just a picture, it says, of Christ in the church. So if I can talk about that picture, why can't I talk about the bigger picture of me loving God? I loved it because a while back there was these t-shirts came out and said, Real men love God. I was like, what? Real men love Jesus, Real men love Jesus you know. And I was like, good. Every man should love God. Every man should love Jesus. I mean, if they just knew how much he loved them, they'd be like, of course. If they understood how important it is for them to get into his kingdom, which I don't know if any... Have you guys heard very many messages about preaching about that you need to love God? Because it's important to the whole big picture, like you getting into heaven. Anybody heard this message before? Raise your hand. I just want to see... How many folks have had this pointed out? You know this one, right? You heard, you heard me. Sh you heard me share. That's cheating. You don't count. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else that didn't hear me preach it? No, I'm just curious if other preachers are preaching that you need to love God. Do you think it's an important message? I mean, how important is this on the scale of you know? Say they only get to go to church one time. What kind of message should they hear that day? As far as I'm concerned, I hope you hear this one. Because this is one that's going to get you into heaven for eternity. Who cares about the rest? That's just filler. This is the one that counts for you to get in your, your eternal soul will be placed either in heaven or hell depending on your answer, your free will. It's your choice. Whether you want to respond to God and say, God, I'll love you. If you say, I'll love you, guess what? He goes, I know that guy. This is the way he is. He knows who loves him. Come on, think about it. Do we know when someone loves us? Can we feel it when they show? I mean, they don't even have to say it. How many of you know, have family members you know really do love you? Without, without words. I mean, you can just be around them the way they are. That You can just feel that love. Can God tell when we love him? Are we allowed to say it? Sure. You're allowed to say it. Please at least make sure you do it at least once or twice in your life. I don't know what I'm saying to you. You didn't ever... I'm not even sure. But Lord, I kind of gestured. I don't know if that'll fly. Just say, I love you, Lord. It's a really great thing to do. It's a, it's a, it's a discipline for Christians that just ensures their salvation. It's all the, someday he's going to say, I know you, get in here, Aaron. You love me. But if you don't, and if you ever wondered, if you, maybe, maybe this isn't the message because you need to hear because you already love God. But maybe you have a friend or a family member that they don't know this part. And you just take it for granted, like everybody knows this. 
Right? This is like basic stuff. This is like the beginning. It is the beginning of your relationship with Him. But our relationship with God starts with love. It starts with Him. For God so loved the world, right? He loved us first. He gave what? His Son. And whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting. That, that's not till the Gospel of John, chapter 3. You guys already know the verse, right? John 3, what? 16. It's like on the football games, you know, the guy flashing the sign, John 3, 16. He's saying, God so loved us. I'm telling you, make sure 1 Corinthians 8, 3. I never see it flashed in the signs, in the stands, but 1 Corinthians 8, 3. But if you love God, you're known by him. And being known by him is important. Because you look at Matthew chapter 7 and you go, yep, pretty important. I don't want him saying to me, get out of here, I never knew you. I want him going, I know you, come on in. Let's go. Anyone else with me on this? Here, here. Here, here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. I made it without coughing too much. Thank you for all my brothers and sisters that prayed for me. I pray that as we go from here, you would fill us with your love. Your love to overflowing, Lord, to you, to our fellow brothers and sisters, Lord. And even for the ones that, that we don't like, you said even to pray for our enemies. So we pray for them as we close, Lord, that you would, that you would help our enemies. I pray that like you change Saul into Paul, from a persecutor of the faith to a proclaimer of the faith. I pray for those ones that are fighting against your gospel, Lord, that you would show them great grace. Let them come to know your grace and let them come to know your salvation. That they could be changed and, and saved and the devil wouldn't win a victory, Lord. That instead they would wind up being ones that also will come with us to heaven. You said to pray for enemies. That's the best prayer I know to pray for them. So that they would come to know your love. Lord, send us from this place filled with your love now. In Jesus' name I ask. And everyone that agree with me said... Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.